give it up for these guys. Amazing job, Olivia, wonderfully done. Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for this class period. I just ask that you'd bless it. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, guys, I got a couple announcements for you. Then we're going to bring Pastor Jeremy back up. How many of you were blessed by his message yesterday? Amen. Throw your hand up if you are graduating this semester, okay? All those that are graduating this semester, if you have not made an appointment with our graduation people over in our academics department, this Friday the 24th is the last time to do that. I, the records officer, is that her title? Sandy, Sandy the records officer. I was like, forgot her job title for a second, but go meet with Miss Sandy. Um, this Friday is the last time you can do that. So if you're planning on graduating and you haven't done that, please do it by Friday, okay? Amazing, then I got two more announcements for you. This Saturday is our dodgeball tournament. So if you have that slide, <laughs> Throw it up. If you have not registered yet, go ahead and register that. I think Mila and Haven are heading that up, and they're going to do a glow-in-the-dark dodgeball in the gym, so they're going to black out all the windows with, like, tarps and stuff, so it's going to be really dark and scary and dodgeball-y, so, you know, don't get hurt, but go ahead and register and win that thing. Um, yeah, amazing. And then our second announcement that we got for you, how many of you enjoyed the Imago Day event, which was the art show that we had last month? So we had such great reception from that that we're planning on doing it again next month. So if you are wanting to sign up to display your work or to do a performance or anything like that, um, our man Righteous over here is gonna be heading this up. He's put together a wonderful team. So with that, if you wanna sign up to display work, he also wants to expand it to do performing arts a little bit. So if you have something you wanna perform or anything like that, please scan this QR code, get in touch with his team so we can have a wonderful night. I think there's gonna be food there. It's gonna be incredible. We're gonna have fellowship. We're gonna have music. We're gonna have art. It's gonna be a wonderful time to worship the Lord and also glorify him through our creative abilities. Amen? Amen. So that is all the announcements I got for you today. Please welcome up Pastor Jeremy to give the word today. Hello, 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 hello. It is so great to be with you again. How many of you in here are absolutely uneligible to allow your art to be displayed because it's just stick figures like children? Yeah, that's me. For all of you talented individuals, hey, um, we're a little envious, but that is a, a pretty cool little uh, thing you guys have going on. Uh, real quick, I just want to quickly honor uh, some of the staff at um, CFNI. If you work uh, for the school, would you just quickly stand? I know Golan's here. We would love to just honor you and just thank you guys. Anybody? I saw some people. Wait, if you were back there, I didn't get to see you. Some of you in the back, you still? Okay, awesome. Thank you so much. All, all of our sound booth guys. See, if, if it weren't for them, it's like, man, they just shut it all down. Lights off, you know, no... No media, I mean, we'd be in some trouble. So thank you guys. We know the hard work that it takes to uh, produce something like this. And so again, for the staff, all the behind the scenes work is incredible. And we know for all you students, you have some behind the scene work and homework and wrestling through uh, your, your, your classes and your assignments. And so there's a lot that goes uh, on here at CFNI, and I just think it's absolutely phenomenal uh, to have each and every one of you here, especially the staff. So we just want to honor all of you today. Um, real quick, uh, I'm going to just jump right off into um, the, the books. I gave you some of you I spoke to yesterday. You were asking me about more books, and so the books that I just wanted to like let you know some of the ones that have impacted my life that I suggest you read. Uh, one is called Evidence That Demands a Verdict. Ed Evidence that demands a verdict by Josh and Sean McDowell. There's an updated, there's an updated version. She's excited. I'm, I wish all of you were that excited, right? So there you go. Thank you. Um, it's an amazing, amazing apologetic work that really defends uh, the Bible, the history of the text, and it's absolutely phenomenal. There's another work by The Cross of Christ by John Stott. John Stott, a, an extremely talented theologian, a British man. He lived a celibate life. Literally, he lived celibate so that uh, he could devote his time and energy to the scriptures, and you will not be sorry to buy the book, The Cross of Christ. Another great one, Celebration of Discipline. 
discipline, celebration of discipline by Richard Foster, phenomenal book on spiritual disciplines. Uh, the fourth one, how many of you in here have, you're here at CFNI because you felt a call for the ministry and you're here because you want to be trained for the mission field? How many of you? Okay, this is a must read for you and it's called Dangerous Calling. Dangerous Calling. Dangerous Calling by Paul David Tripp, by Paul Tripp. He's got a brother named uh, Ted Tripp who's got some phenomenal stuff on uh, parenting. But this work right here, Dangerous Calling, I highly recommend it. And I would say put it on your bookshelf. Read it after you're done with CF&I. Uh, if you, I, I recommend it to every individual I know who's going into the ministry. And it just talks about the challenges of working in the ministry. Uh, the last one, amazing book. I read it here. I found out about it here while I was at CF&I. Uh, it's called uh, Knowing God by J.I. Packer. J.I. Packer. Uh, he's got an interesting story. He, uh, I, think he's, I think he's British as well. Uh, he got kicked in the head at like six. He was six, seven years old, got kicked in the head by a horse and actually fractured his skull. He was really, uh, you know, wanted to do sports all of his life. He, 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 the, because they pulled out a piece of his skull, he couldn't play sports because they, they thought he would, could potentially die. And so he devoted his life to reading. He got saved and he just invested all of his energy, all of his passion, all of his life into God's word. And this book, Knowing God, will be an, an incredible blessing for you. I would say maybe that summer, some of this is summer reading. This first book, Evidence That Demands a Verdict, is going to really challenge your thinking, but I highly recommend it. Now, uh, Pastor Adam uh, yesterday told you guys that I'm from Louisiana. I'm born and raised in Metairie, New Orleans. How, anybody from Louisiana in here? Where are you from? Morgan City. Morgan City. Come on out. New Orleans. Lafayette. Lafayette. Monroe. Monroe. All over. Where? Madisonville, oh, that's nice. Wait, wait, I'm sorry, what? I can't hear you. West Monroe, awesome. Well, listen, I, no, so my friends from uh, Louisiana are gonna know, maybe Pastor Adam has given you a couple of uh, jokes before about Boudreaux and Thibodeau. Yes, no, let me just give you one. Let me just start off with a little joke, thank you. I'll just talk to my six friends in here from Louisiana, everybody else, just for a couple minutes, put your headphones in, don't do that. Um, but listen, just hang along for the ride. So listen, uh, Thibodeau uh, was needing a haircut, and so he decided to go to Boudreaux's shop. And uh, he gets in there, he waits his turn, and he sits down in the chair and Boudreaux says, what can I do for you? He says, listen, you know, I really just need a haircut and I've been seeing a lot of the guys walk out of this store and, and out of your shop and they have a nice, clean shave. And Boudreaux, I'm about to go out on a date with my wife. I'm gonna need you to give me that nice, clean shave. Boudreaux says, hey, listen, I got, I got it for you. Here, let me, uh, I, he goes to his drawer, he pulls out a little ball, takes the ball and he says, here, yeah, put this in your mouth. This is, this is the X factor. And he says, you just put it in your mouth there and I'm gonna get real close to the skin. It's gonna be nice and tidy. It's gonna be beautiful. You're gonna be, you're never gonna look so good. So he goes and says, all right, Boudreaux, I trust you. He puts it in his mouth and he starts shaving. And, and as he's shaving, he, he says, oh yeah, well, Boudreaux, what happens if I, if I swallow this ball? And Boudreaux says, what happens if you swallow the ball? That's not a big deal. You just, you just go home and bring it back tomorrow like the guy before you. Yeah, yeah. We eat crawfish. <laughs> Suck the heads out of them things and everything. Now, let's go to the text. <laughs> let's go to God's word. Maybe we should pray after that one. What do you think? <laughs> Today we're gonna to talk about a topic that is near to my heart and I know it's near and dear to CF&I because this school was founded on certain principles and prayer certainly being one of them. And so I wanna just talk to you a little bit today about prayer. And these are not things that you've not heard before. Without a doubt, you've heard these things. Um, 
You've heard about worship. You've heard about the word. And it's, these are fundamental things that I would like to just quickly talk about. This one particular thing specifically today. And I'm going to pray and ask the Lord that he would do something deep and meaningful in, in, in your lives. And uh, that something would be imparted to you, a spirit of prayer, the mentality or, and, and a drive and a passion for God that would cause you to go alone and be found by God in secret. And the God who sees in secret will, will reward you openly. Let's pray. Father, I ask right now that as we go off into this text and we go off into uh, this theme, this topic of prayer, I pray that these students would be edified. I ask that your spirit would rest upon them, Lord, and that there would be a kind of a tenacity, a kind of vitality and energy that would pervade this student body that would cause them, Lord, to forsake other lovers and be alone with God. It would cause them to forsake things and to cling to the mercy seat, to pour themselves out far greater than a formal exercise, but that it would be their life's bread to go and be found by Jesus and be found as ones who would be praying in the secret place. And so I thank you that you'll do it. I ask, Lord, that you would allow us just to have, to have a fun time and that we would all rest, recover through these, uh, through these days, through spring break, and that our minds would be attentive. In Jesus' name we pray. What's everybody saying? Amen. 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 Man, just looking out at CF and I, it is really so cool to be back here. And I just, uh, this is kind of a parenthesis as well. I mean, I remember being a student here and, you know, just my time here. You know, if there's one bit of advice that I could give students, especially for some of you, how many of you in your first semester? First semester students? Awesome. Thank you for being here. It's a great, so great. To, this is the advice I would, I, would, I would submit to you and I would ask you just to really consider. And I think... Every student would probably say the same, or mostly. Get involved in a church. Like, literally, that is one of my biggest regrets uh, being here at Golan, is I, I, I kind of church hopped while I was here, and I never really got invested. I went, I went to church. Is it still a requirement, so you got to check it, like, no, like it was for us. No, no. Yeah, well, we had to go to church. And so I was just kind of, I'm like, man, I'm in Dallas. There's so many amazing churches. I mean, you know, like Gateway, there's um, uh, Matt Chandler's church. There's a lot of great churches out here. And so the ones that you go to, uh, and I just kind of bounced around with some of my friends, and I, and I kind of regret that. I would ask you to learn from my regret right now and get involved, get invested, and go sit under their leadership and their structure and allow God through these people to pour into your life. If you believe it, say amen. 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 Well, I stand here today before you as a convicted man. As I begin to read and study and to remind myself of this topic of prayer, I've really uh, begun to wrestle with the fact that the, the prayer meeting is one of the fewest and the most, the, the most seldom attended meeting in the church. I mean, if we have a, a worship meeting, everyone's going to go, especially if you have an amazing band like CF&I and some of these great churches have amazing bands. So it's easy to get people to come and to listen to music. If you have a great speaker, it's easy to get people to go to hear this great speaker. If you have a men's group, a, a, a women's meetings and all these retreats, it's easy to fill up the seats, but it's not so easy in a context of the local church to have a prayer meeting. And that's very concerning for me. It's very concerning to me that the football games are more readily attended than the prayer meeting. It's concerning to me that, that the prayer meeting and meeting with God in the inner chambers of our hearts and our homes is something that is really just not really considered as something that, I mean, we know cognitively, like if we're taking a test and it's true or false, prayer's important, of course, we're gonna say true, but it's like in our practice, how is there this, uh, the, 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 the variance, so the difference of our practice and what we would profess, again, like those disciples we were talking about yesterday. It's concerning to me that we have the countless meetings with friends and so few 
meetings with gods. It's concerning to me that we will schedule and we will be thoughtful about social media posts, but we won't schedule and be thoughtful about specific meetings that we have with God. I mean, those of you who work out, and I highly recommend it, Paul said, hey, listen, bodily exercise profits some, but rather exercise yourself unto godliness. Exercise yourself for things that will last. And absolutely, I think you should invest yourself in eating well, eating right. Jonathan Edwards, if you know the name, he had these resolutions. And one of his resolutions, uh, before I think he was like 20, maybe 24, 23, he had these resolutions that he would live by, which in the 1700s, that was a common thing for men to do. And they would write these resolutions. And one of his resolutions from one of the greatest thinkers in American, in American theology, in American Christian history is he said resolved never to eat anything that would make me lethargic so that I could not with all my heart, mind, soul, and strength to pursue God. And the place, of, he wouldn't eat fried chicken because it would make him lethargic in the place of prayer. He wouldn't eat things that would, if he ate it and it made him feel bad and he couldn't pursue God by spiritually or intellectually and academically, he wouldn't do it. He was resolved because he had things uh, upon his life and he just saw the cross of Christ and it was more valuable than bread. I do like some Popeyes though, I'm not gonna lie. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm concerned that we're going to hear a message again that may even be convicting. And what I'm concerned about, I'm concerned for you, I'm concerned that maybe the church at large would hear a message about prayer and it would be theologically built and structured, but we won't have a theological response. We won't have a biblical response to the biblical things that we hear. And if you know anything about theology and our requirements to God, that when we're given things, we are accountable to them, I'm very concerned. Again, I stand here today before you as a convicted man and I am, I am desperate for you to grab a hold of a spirit of prayer, the practice of prayer, that you would participate in it, that you would constantly pray even until prayer, until this duty becomes delight. I'm very concerned. And before we get off into this topic, I'd like to just quote to you one thing, and I would love to, even in, a, in, a, in an attitude of prayer is the way I would pray this over you. Is Polycarp, one of the church, early church fathers, he, he had a prayer and he said, clothe us with zeal as with a garment so that passion would be, it would be so distinct upon your life. It would be like I could see that you had these shirts, sweaters on. I could see it's visible. I could see the colors of your attire. And that Polycarp is saying, let zeal be like that. Let it bleed through you. I'm concerned in the church that we're, that we're known for so many things. There are preachers who are, you know, preachers and sneakers. Like we're known, like on Instagram, have y'all seen that? It's hilarious, but, um, but I'm so concerned that we're known for our sneakers and not our prayer life. I'm concerned that we're known for all these different elements, our church size and our church budgets and all the different things that we do, but we're not known for prayer again, that God would cover us with a zeal. He would clothe us with a zeal. He would clothe you and I with a zeal as with a garment, stirring up, it's, he says, our affections into the most vehement flame so that there would be a passion inside of us. It would burn and it would touch other people around us. You don't have to look long at our world today before you start seeing the effects of sin in the earth. There's social strife. A, there's a unbelievable. Dr. Brown came a couple of weeks ago, I think two weeks ago, and he spoke off of his new book, I believe. Um, you know, why are so many people leaving the faith? 
Why, is all, why are all these things happening? It's a question that he's wrestling through and he's asking you to wrestle through and the, the, the effects of sin and how it's reaching even into our own lives. And we see political unrest and we're, we're asking what's going on, political unrest and social strife. People who were once friends are now enemies. There's an unprecedented amount of, of flooding across the world. Fires all over California, unprecedented. These geophysical and social disturbances, wars, rumors of wars, the things going on in Ukraine, all over the world, these, these atrocities in the name of, you know, my justice or my truth. And the Christian who, who, who is going to be prophetic and who is going to have the heart of God must ask himself this question. You must ask yourself this question, where is God? Where is he at in the middle of all of these things? And part of the biblical answer to these things can be found, I think, in a few different verses. Ezekiel 22.30, a very popular verse. I'll just read it if you could turn with me in your Bibles. Ezekiel 22.30 and 31. I believe it's on the screen too. There it is. But I hope you have Bibles here at Christ for the Nations Bible Institute, right? The Lord says, he says, I sought for a man among them. God is seeking for ones. He is, it says, the Bible says that the eyes of the Lord are looking to and fro across the earth, right? He's wanting to show himself strong. He's wanting to work through people. And I sought for a man among them who should build up the wall and stand in the breach before me. Come on, if you've been churched, you know this passage that God is looking for people who would stand before him. It's literally stand in the gap. And we'll see in this scripture, who would, he would stand in the breach before me for the land that I should not destroy it. Like God was angry with his people and he was coming in vengeance with a sword with fire. He was upset. And he said, I'm angry, I have mercy and grace, I'm looking for someone to come between me and them. That I should not destroy it. I am sought for a man among them who would just stand in the breach, stand, make a wall before me for the land that I should not destroy it, but I found no one. Let it not be said of your generation that God can find no one who is standing before him. Therefore, the Lord says, I have poured out my indignation upon them. I have consumed them with the fire of my wrath. And I have returned their way upon their heads, declares the Lord. Second Chronicles 7.14. This was a scripture in 2020. Again, it was going out uh, like crazy in the midst of this pandemic. Again, the Lord says, when I shut up the heavens so there is no more rain, there's drought in the land. And I command the locusts, I will command, who's the commander? Who's the commander of the locusts? God. Or I, I shut up the heavens. He's commanding the locusts to devour the land or send the pestilence among the people. But if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and they will pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, I will hear from them and I will forgive their sins and I will hear, heal their land. One more in Jeremiah 29. Jeremiah 29. Again, these are not, you know, obscure passages that you have not seen. There's nothing, you know, we, we know these. People have been preaching these for generations. And again, part of my concern is that we know them all too well, that we don't try and practice what we see in the the scripture, it says, for thus says the Lord. I mean, this is the, this is the hype verse. You know, I know that I have the plans, declares the Lord. I know I have these good things, but let's look at it in context. And, I, and I'm not being trite about that. I just, let's look at it in its big picture and not just look at one small thing. For thus, um, for thus says the Lord, when 70 years of complete for Babylon, I will visit you. And I will fulfill to you my promises to bring you back. So what's happening in this text? 
the nation is being judged. He, the Lord called the Assyrians to judge the nation of Israel. Uh, then they rebelled again. Then he called the Babylonians after. And he's like, listen, you really messed up this time. You're going to go into captivity for 70 years. This is my punishment. It's going to be severe. I mean, God deals severely with his people. So this is the Lord saying through Jeremiah, he's like, hey, you guys are about to go into captivity. You're in captivity, but I want you to know something. You're gonna go, he's got an allotted time. He's gonna, give, he's gonna punish you. You're gonna be in prison for 70 years and then he's gonna visit you. You can have hope and expectation that God will visit you. Okay, for thus says the Lord, when the 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will visit you and I will fulfill my promise and I will bring you back to this place. How many of you know Romans eleven twenty nine? 29, the gifts and callings of God are irrevocable. They're irreversible. Like he's not done, even with his nation Israel. He's not done with Israel, even to this day. He still has a remnant. He still has a people, okay? So when the 70 years are, I will visit, I will, I will fulfill all my promises to bring you back to this place. For I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord, for welfare, not for evil, even in the midst of your punishment, even in the midst of your chastisement, Plans for welfare, not for evil, to give you a future and hope. So he's saying, even in the midst of your punishment, I want you to have hope. Even in the midst when you feel like God is so far, you can, friends, have hope. Now listen, this is what's happening. After the punishment was over, Jeremiah is saying, hey, listen, you better call upon the name of the Lord. Call upon his name. It says, you will seek me. It's still from the Lord. You will seek me and find me. When you seek me with all of your heart, and I will be found by you, declares the Lord, and I will restore your fortunes and gather you from all the nations of the earth, all, all the nations and all the places where I have driven you, declares the Lord, and I will bring you back to the place from which I sent you in exile. Let me say it like this. Through all these passages, Ezekiel, Jeremiah, we have God, that God wills for us to be a praying people. Okay, God wills for us to be a praying people. Let me say it like this. God wills to work through the prayers of his people. Okay, let me say it like this. God wants to bring about remarkable change in the earth because of and through the prayers of his people. Okay, so, you know, a few, it was in the middle of February, you know, this thing happened in Asbury. I don't know if y'all heard about that, um, being sarcastic. Uh, so I have prayed for revival for a long time. And I know everyone here at CFNI has. We want to see a, a, an amazing outpouring of God's spirit. And I have even said, like, I want my kids to live in it. I want my kids to see a move and experience of God. And, and, I, and, I, and I literally, I, I had preached like two weeks before the outpouring at, at Asbury. I preached at our church, and that was one of the things that I said. I'm like, I want my kids to see it. I want to live in it. So, I, so it, this thing happens at Asbury, and my wife is like, hey, let's go. I'm like, go where? She's like, let's go to Asbury. You said you wanted the kids to see it. Let's go. I was like... Okay, let's go. So we just packed up real quick on a Sunday after church, and we drove up to um, Kentucky. And my goodness, it was, I didn't know what to expect. I, I was talking to my, anybody from Kentucky? Yeah. Kentucky okay, awesome. It, first of all, it's beautiful. I love it. It's way nicer than um, Baton Rouge. Anyway, um, so we get up there, I'm prepping my kids. You know, if you know anything about the atmosphere of God, you'll know that the atmosphere of expectancy is the breeding ground for miracles. And so if you can expect God to do something, there's this sense, even as we're reading through these three passages, when we're expecting God to do something and we have that faith, and then we'll take him by his word, and then we'll act, he will find us as the person who is standing in the gap. He will find us to be ones who are seeking with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and then he will move. We, can, we have his promises. 
And we, we can lay his word at his own feet and he'll respond. And so we drove up to Asbury. I'm encouraging my kids. I'm like, listen, I, and I have five kids. They're awesome. I have Judah. He's, how old is he? He's nine. Um, Maggie is eight. Caroline is uh, seven. Vivian is five and Joel is one. The last time I was here, we didn't have Joel. I really wanted a boy because I have one boy, three girls. I'm like, Lord, give me a, I want a son. I prayed for a son. And I, the first person I met here at, at CFNI while we were here a couple years ago is his name was Joel. And I was like, Lord, if it's a boy, I'm gonna name him Joel. And so now his name is Joel. And so... Uh, Joel, it means Yael, it means Yahweh is the Lord. Anyway, uh, so we're, I'm, I'm encouraging my kids, you know, to, that what we're going to experience can be a great time. And so we get there and uh, it was unlike anything I had ever heard the, from the, the, the reports that I'd seen that the town that Asbury and I think it's Woodsville or something like that, am I correct? Uh, it, I think it, it, it's about 6,000 people. It's very small. It's very incredibly small. And the Saturday before I went, there were 20,000 people at Asbury. 20,000 people. It was intense. So I went on a, we went on a Monday. I have my kids. And so we get there probably 10 o'clock. Y'all, I waited. We, my wife and my family, my little kids waited in line to get into the chapel for about six hours I mean, we waited, and while we're waiting, there are people breaking out guitars, praying. I mean, they're literally holding hands, praying. Like, they're believing that God is going to do something phenomenal. And you know how all of this was birthed, and it just went on? They actually moved it. Hey, if you're sleeping in here, could you wake up? I don't think I'm that boring. If you're sleeping in here, I just ask you to wake up. If not, hey, if you need to just go walk around the back, you should do that. But uh, sorry, probably shouldn't call out people. Okay, we're good. I'm good. <laughs> but, um, you know, really what we're concerned with is the glory of God. And I want you to be concerned with his glory, with his nature. And that you would honor his word. Not for me, but, f but for the Lord. So, you know, the way Asbury started is it started through, uh, they had a chapel and I think the word was like, we're gonna contend with God on behalf of our generation. And they prayed, I think, I think there were 18 students, I think it was, and they stay 18 students, and that's how it all began, from 18 students. And so my point is, is that God wills to work through a praying people, a people, and there was nothing impressive about Asbury. Your worship, let it be on record, like, your worship at CF and I is way better. It isn't even close. Like, I'm serious. You guys are blessed. Like, you're musicians. You're, but there was nothing impressive about it. I mean, they had some good singers. They had a guy on a piano. I mean, it was, it, was, it, was, it was nice. And it was, but you know the special thing about it? There was a massive, tangible presence of God. They just had a guitar. The girl just had a guitar. And like there was a five, six, seven, eight thousand people in the most intense worship of their life. I mean, my little kids, my four-year-old had her hands lifted, standing on a chair, pouring out her soul to the Lord. I mean, for like 45 minutes. And if you know anything about a four or five-year-old, that's not normal. Like there was something, we were caught up in the pursuit of God in this moment to pour our souls out to the Lord in prayer and in worship. And my, my, my little girl, Vivian, she, she worshiped and prayed so hard, Golan, that literally I picked her up. She asked me to hold her. After all this time, I'm holding her. She falls asleep. I put her on the ground, and she just slept for another hour. And I'm like, come on, stay there in the presence. Sleep if you have to. <laughs> just not in chapel. Anyway, um, you know, there are signs in our lives that God is calling us to seek him and be found by him. Strife. When there's strife in your life, you, that should be a sign to you. That should be like a, a dinner bell, like calling you, like, hey, come, seek God. When there's sickness, seek God. When there is a lack in your life, seek God. When there's financial burdens and pressures, hey, seek God. God is working through these things to call you to seek him. But the question, the question that I have today is, are we seeking him? 
You may say, of course, I'm seeking him, but I don't find the answer. Like I've been there, and I'm, no, I'm sure you have, where you're really seeking your soul, you're pouring yourself out through prayer, and you're not seeing the answers that you're praying for. I, I, I would ask, humbly ask, but are you really seeking him? Sometimes the answer is that, like Paul, he says he prayed three times that this thing would be moved away, and the Lord says, no, no, my grace is sufficient. So there are times that I think that God just wants you to work through something, and he wants to, to show you in the process, but then that other times, I think God wants to demonstrate his power. And the reason that we don't have that demonstration is because we're not seeking and we're not going after him when we seek, Jeremiah 29, 13, with all of our heart, we're not pursuing him. But do we really seek do we really pray like 1 Thessalonians 5, 17, where it says pray without ceasing? Do we really pray like Colossians 4, 2, that we would continue steadfast in prayer, being watchful with thanksgiving, watchful in prayer with thanksgiving for the things that we're seeking God for? Do we really pray like Romans 12, 12, where it says rejoice in hope, be patient in tribulation, be constant in prayer? The things that you're going through, you're patient in them, being constant and continuing a life of prayer. Do we really devote ourselves like that? Let me read something to you. George Mueller, if you don't know the name, write it down. George Mueller, in his diary in 1844, he wrote down, I began to pray for the conversion of five individuals. In 1844, November, he began to pray for five. He's writing this in his diary, maybe for his kids, who knows, I then began to pray for five individuals. I prayed every day without a single intermission, whether sick or in health, whether on land or in sea, whether in the, whatever the pressures of my engagements might be. 18 months elast, elapsed before the first of the five was converted. He prayed for 18 months before one of them was converted, and I thanked God, and I prayed on. Five years elapsed until the second was converted. I thanked God for the second, and I prayed on for the other three. Day by day, I continued to pray for them. Six years lapsed before the third was converted. I thanked God for the three, and I went on praying for the other two. These two remained unconverted for 36 years. He wrote later in his diary that the other two, one of the sons of Mueller's friends, were still not converted. And he says, but I hope in God and I pray on and I look forward to the answer. They are not converted yet, but they will be. And in, and in 1897, 52 years after he began to pray daily without interruption for the conversion of these two men, the final two were converted and then he died. This man drove himself like a fury. For whatever reason, God placed this in his heart and he was passionate about it. I mean, how many of you know you've gotta be passionate about something to pray for 52 years? I would say you have to be passionate about something to pray for something every day without interruption for six months. Yeah. Friends, are there things that you're praying for for a week, for a month? Go after God. Let that thing burn in you like a fury. My friends, when I'm talking about prayer I'm, today, I'm not specifically, specifically talking about those small prayers, which are absolutely uh, crucial. You know, pray before our meal. We pray before an interview. We pray before we're going into a, a stressful situation. You see this girl that you like, and you're like, Lord, please help me not say anything stupid, right? You, you pray, girls, when you see, was it ring before spring? You know, I don't know. You're praying for that ring before spring, and like we're almost in spring. Like, Lord, where are you? at. You know, I'm not talking about those little prayers. I'm talking about something a little bit deeper. And I think we should have those small prayers in our life. Absolutely. But if we don't develop a kind of intensity to pray deep, not only wide, we are not mining right. We're not going after the jewels that are found in prayer. 
Let me, let me illustrate with this in James 5, verse 17. Thank you so much. I'm glad we have people like you in the front row. Yeah, James, yay, Rachel. James 5, 17. James 5, 17. It says, Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed fervently that it might not rain for three years and six months, and it didn't rain on the earth. I mean, that's a spectacular thing. It says, then he prayed again, and heaven gave rain, and the earth bore its fruit. So Elijah, this is what James is saying. He's like, hey, guys, you know Elijah? You remember that guy in the Old Testament? He was a man who was just like us. He was a human being, girls. Like, he had his own stresses of the day. He had a queen after him, right? Like, he was in some trouble. He had strife. He had stress. Hey, all of his friends are, are, are denying the Lord. And God called him to be a hammer against the nail. And how many of you know it's not always easy being the hammer? The nail doesn't like it. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. Like, consider that. He was like us. Sometimes we put these guys on a, on a pedestal, like the disciples. We put them up there. But then we realize, like, they really weren't the best of the best of the best, like we discussed yesterday. But they were men with a nature like ours. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. But this is the key that James is trying to say. He says he prayed fervently. If you have your Bible, you can underline it, write down that, write down this, write this down right now. He prayed fervently. It is an idiom, which is basically trying to communicate something. It actually doesn't translate very well from Greek to English. It actually literally is just translated. He prayed in his prayers. He prayed in his prayers. In other words, it was more than a formal exercise. Elijah poured himself into his prayers. It was almost like an arrow. His prayers were like an arrow being shot at something. It was all of his life, all of his being was being poured out into these, to these words before his God on behalf of a situation. And, you know, the text doesn't say why he prayed for, to, for the rain, but they, he had reasons and whether or not God told him to do it, but he, he wrestled with God and he prayed fervently, he prayed with passion. He prayed with zeal that it wouldn't rain. And it didn't rain. You know, I remember when, after I left Christ for the Nations, I, I um, went into the South Pacific as a missionary. I came back and uh, went to finished up my uh, undergrad. I had the awesome opportunity after that uh, to get married and also to move to Orlando. I worked at a ministry called uh, Christ for All Nations, Christ for All Nations, the ministry of Reinhard Bunke. And I had the great privilege of spending, you know, large portions of time with him uh, at, at times when his assistant, whose name was Andrew, uh, wasn't available, they'd call me. Like, I got to travel with him, be alone with him. I was in his home, had some great, great, great memories. One time, he started losing some weight. A doctor, he just wanted him, like, hey, you know, we're on this health kick, this journey. He starts working out, Golan, you'd have loved it. And, uh, I mean, I'm so much stronger than Golan. But, uh, no, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. That, that was a joke. I don't want to challenge anything right now. Uh, I'll be embarrassed quickly. Um, but, so, he's, he starts working out, he's losing this weight, and he calls me. He's like, Jeremy, please come over, I, I need to go shopping for a belt. And I'm like, okay, well, that, that's amazing. Let's go get a belt. I uh, get to go shopping with Reinhard Bunky for a belt. So I go pick him up, and we're about to go, and he's, he's calling for his wife. Her name's Annie Bunky. He's, Annie, Annie, please come. And so I'm like, okay, what are we doing? We're about to leave. And we get into this little triangle, just the three of us. He says, let us pray. And I was like, Okay, we, okay, well, that, that's cool. Let's pray. So we're holding hands, and he pray, starts praying that the Lord would be gracious in finding him a belt. And he says something spectacular. He says, oh, Lord, please open the doors for us to find the perfect belt for your servants. And he says, oh, God, would you use these mortal hands on our journey to establish your eternal kingdom? So it wasn't just the stage. It was literally everywhere he went. And the, the reason I share that story, and there's another, I'll tell you another quick story, and I'll tell you why I'm sharing it. We, we were out again with, um, with, with, uh, uh, with, with an individual who was in parliament in uh, Zimbabwe. And so he came in to visit with, with uh, Pastor Bunky. And so we're all, we went and ate. And we go to his house, and his wife made these German, uh, like, uh, desserts. 
And, you know, everybody prays over dinner, right? Like, that's appropriate. Like, let's pray and thank God. But who prays over dessert? I'm like, who? So he's like, oh, let us pray. I'm like, we already prayed for dinner. You don't have to pray for dessert. Like, every American knows that. You just eat and indulge, right? And so he prays, and he says, Oh, Lord, let not the rocks cry out with more gratitude than your people for these cakes. And I'm like, oh, my gosh. The reason I share this story, because this was a very intense man of prayer. And whether his prayers were long, and I've been around those, or whether his prayers were short, he had an intensity, a fervency, and he literally, in all of those prayers, he had learned I don't think it was this supernatural gift of God. I think he actually learned to pray in his prayers. And I think you can learn to pray in your prayers. One preacher said one of the greatest problems in the church today is that we seldom pray in our prayers. Again, there's hope for us because Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. And if he could stir himself up to pray with fervency and passion and to go after God, so can we. You know, a few months ago in October, I actually tore my Achilles, my left Achilles. So I definitely can't outrun any of you. My kids can outrun me right now. Um, and so, you know, I got lethargic and I, I really stopped working out, stopped exercising because I couldn't. And so I was having a hard time, like, going back to the gym. I have to go to therapy, all these stretches, and it it's hurts. It's painful. If you've ever torn a ligament, it's awful. I hope that none of you experience it. And um, one of the things I'm, like, trying to, to kind of work through, like, apathy, like, physical apathy, and just try to, you know, engage my body and to put my body under certain stress for, just for discipline well, I was talking to a friend who was a Navy SEAL, and uh, he was like, dude, ice baths. I was like, that's the stupidest thing I've ever heard. I ain't taking no ice bath. So anyway, I reluctantly started doing it, and I put, like, ice in my tub and willfully, like, do you understand the kind of tenacity? And I'm not saying, like, like I'm weak. It's awful. I'm like a little baby when I get into a I, a tub filled with ice, but I did it as an exercise to my soul and to my body to, to go after it. And so if some of you, you need to practice prayer, it's literally a practice, it's an exercise, and just tell yourself, like, no, I can do it. I can be passionate about prayer and go and do it. And if there's other things that you have to do and get along with friends and other disciplines in your life, go after it, but let Prayer be your target because that's the chief end that God is using to work in our world. So what is prayer? Prayer is simply communicating with God in its simplest form. And there's all kinds of prayers, just like there's all kinds of conversations. There's all sorts of, I could ask for forgiveness from you. I could ask for something like, hey, I need you know, a ride to the airport. I could ask um, we, we could just have a, a normal conversation, wanting to know what you know, kind of figure things out. I could ask for help. All sorts of different kinds of conversations, and there's all sorts of different kinds of prayers that we can have for God, but prayer simply is communicating with God for the purpose of connecting with God. Prayer is the pouring out of the soul to God. Prayer is literally pouring ourselves out and appearing before the Lord. Prayer is also a deep acknowledgement of our dependency upon God. Abraham Lincoln once said, he said, I have been driven to my knees uh, by the overwhelming conviction that I had nowhere else to go. By my own wisdom and all that about me, they seemed insufficient for the day. So I had to pray. St. Augustine, he says that he that prays a little loves a little, and he that prays much loves much. I would suggest that prayer is an expression of love. Prayer is an expression of love. So why pray? Well, I don't think this is like a, a, there's a magical answer here. <laughs> I don't think there's something special about it, but the scripture calls us to pray. As we heard yesterday, the Talmudim want to be like Jesus. The disciples wanted to be like him. And Matthew 14, right before he walked on the water, he sent the disciples, all that, that episode, where did he go? He went to the mountain and prayed. Matthew 5, 4, 
It says, pray for those who persecute you. Why pray? We pray for those who persecute you. Pray for their blessing, Matthew 5, 6. And when you pray, there's an assumption. Why should you pray? There's an assumption in the text that we should pray. You should pray because God wills to work in your life through the prayers of his people. You know, another reason we should pray is Jonathan Wesley said, God does nothing in the earth except through prayer. God does nothing in the earth except through prayer. You know, in the busyness of life, right? In the busyness of, of, of uh, the workplace, I have countless meetings in church. And a lot of those meetings, I'm meeting with all kinds of people about strategy, about things that's going on. You know, businessmen, they have meetings. And one of the reasons that they meet is really to get on the same page. They meet to get in connection with each other. And it's the same way in our walk with God as we get in connection with God to get in alignment with what his strategy is in the earth. And God starts to work those things out in us. Charles Wesley said, one of the reasons we should pray is for inner stillness. And for inner stillness, again, Peter says that the winds and the, when he saw the winds and the waves, he began to sink. One of the things that prayer does is it eliminates the winds and the waves and it kind of gives us a tunnel vision and a target that we could pour ourselves out onto something specific. Prayer is inner stillness. And believe me, you guys should know that it is incredibly difficult to find inner stillness in our technological age. I mean, you like your phones are like, I mean, how many of you know, like nothing, you never get the text to go out and have fun until you have committed yourself to prayer, right? Everybody's gonna go do something and they're gonna pay for, man, I just wanna take you out to dinner. Like, man, I just committed myself to prayer. Okay, let's go. All right, you know, so, so many times we give ourselves to prayer and then we're distracted by all these other things. And we have got to be committed to what God has for us. Three things I just wanna leave you with today. Three things, very simply, and I, and I hope you write these down. I hope that um, more than anything that that you would learn through these three things that there's really not a major methodology in prayer. You'll learn it on your own. You will learn it on your own. You will figure it out as you go. But through these three things, these will put you in a position to encounter God. Okay, find a place. Find a place to pray. Matthew 6, 6 says, but when you pray, go into your room, shut the door, pray to your father, is in secret and your father is in secret will reward you openly. The secret of prayer is praying in secret. Worship is amazing. Coming in, like last night was awesome. But you know what? Lovers love to be alone. Not in like big crowds. Like we wanna isolate ourselves. I would much rather be with my wife alone than in a major crowd. Like the intimacy, one-on-one, -on -one, go be alone with God. Find a place. You know, in, in Greek, the word for, uh, shut, you go to your closet and pray, it's a specific thing for something that's isolated. Literally, the closet is a place where nobody else goes. You know, who goes and hangs out in a closet? The person who prays does. That's who. Some of you, go in your closet. When I was at CFNI, I used to pray in the bathroom. I don't think we had closets. No, we didn't have closets. I went to the bathroom. <laughs> he rewards those who are intimate with him. And if you're going to be a praying people, it is necessary for you to find a specific place. I would literally, when I'm saying a place, like literally go find somewhere. Like this is my place of prayer. If it's in your bathroom, do it. If, it, if it's in your car, but it needs to be focused time. Get, a, get away from your phones. Get away from your, your, all the activities. Be by yourself with Jesus. Find an hour to pray. The next one is find an hour. For most of us, it's hard to find a quiet hour. I would encourage you to do your best. Just pick the same time and the same place. Same time, same place. Friends, find the same time and the same place. Find the 
place of prayer. Find the hour of prayer. And third is find a heart. What I mean by that is stir yourself up and exercise yourself with an energy to go into that place, to pray, to seek God, and be found by him. Let's pray. Father, I ask right now, by your spirit, you would grant us an amazing um, a passion for prayer that you would do deep things in our lives. We thank you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Listen, we'll see you guys tomorrow. Have a wonderful day. You are dismissed.